Good morning. It's good to be with you today. How many of you made it this first part of this week, at least one of the nights, to hear Brother David Allen speak? Uh, if you didn't, you missed out. Uh, and I'm just going to go ahead and qualify. We may teach from the same book, but uh, my brain and understanding the scripture is not anywhere close to Brother Allen. He, uh, I love to hear him teach. He really has a grasp of the word, and uh, but I am going to do my best this morning, so just don't compare me. That's all I'm asking. <laughs> God is good all the time. I am always grateful that Brother Jim gives me the opportunity to be at Riverside. I really am. I, I love you guys, and if God hadn't told me to plant myself somewhere else, I'd be here. But uh, I'm sure glad when I get to come and be here. I'm going to invite you to turn with me to the book of Colossians. Chapter 1, starting in verse 15, probably one of my favorite passages when it comes to talking about Jesus and who He is. And that's my question this morning I want us to ask, and I think I'm talking to a group that probably could preach this message better than I could this morning, under the title, Who is Jesus? Uh, it's a simple message, but it's one I hope speaks to each one of us at some point uh, as who Christ is in our own heart and our own minds. Uh, <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1, starting with verse 15. It said, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So who is He? He's talking about he, Who is the image of the invisible God? It's Jesus, right? Just want to make sure we're on the same page here. We're talking about Jesus. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created both in the heavens, <coughs> excuse me, and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. What is all things? Just a, just a brief thought. All, right? Everything. Everything you see or, or don't see, everything that, that is in existence is uh, created by Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Verse 18, this is where I'm going to camp this morning. He is also head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have preeminence or first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of, the, of his cross. Through him I say were the things on earth are things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has recon now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Lord, thank you for your word. You know, for me, when, as I look at that initially, if you don't get anything else, this is the freebie before I start the sermon, if you don't get anything else out of this passage, Jesus is it, and you're not. Let me just throw that in there. Apart from Him, we don't have any hope, do we? We don't, have any, we don't have anything to look forward to because He is all these things. Jesus is. You know, when you think about Jesus, uh, you remember the disciples when they're on the, they're on the, the sea and the winds are blowing and, and Jesus stands up and He said, Peace be still, and suddenly the sea is calm. And what, what do the disciples say? What, what kind of man is this that even the winds and the seas obey? The, the Pharisees, the scribes, they, they begin to reason and they, who, he, they, they said he speak blasphemy. But who can forgive sins except who? 
God. What did Jesus do? Your sins are forgiven. Get up and walk. He forgave those sins. Even today, the question still remains amongst the world, and I'm, I'm praying not in this room, but amongst the world as a, worldwide, who is this Jesus? Who do people say that he is? You know, if there's, you, you can say a name. Uh, right here in America, you could throw out one of the presidential candidates' name, and depending on what crowd you're in, you're probably going to stir something up. But you could be on the other side of the world and mention that name and nobody would even bat an eye at you. But my friend, you mention the name of Jesus anywhere on this planet. And it's going to create a call, a stir. Either for or against. Or maybe even, who is he? I've had that very question posed to me one time. I'll never forget that day. I was, we was in a village in Uganda, we'd been teaching that village and saw several people come to Christ and I'm walking out of there and this gentleman just steps out of a corn row, literally a cornfield. He steps out of that corn row and he grabs me by the arm and I stop and I look at him and he says to my interpreter, they talk for a minute and I said, well, what does he want to know? He says, he wants to know who is this Jesus we speak about. Well, we took time and explained that to him, that he might come to know him as Savior. But the question is, who is Jesus? If someone grab you by the arm tomorrow, walking in Walmart, and ask you, who is this Jesus? Do you have an answer to give them? Who is he? Who is Jesus? Let's look at verse 18. It, we could spend probably a week on this passage of Scripture looking at who Christ is, but I want us to focus on verse 18. It says, he is also the head of the body, the church. Who is the church? Is it this building? No. It's, it's, is it the people that join in this building? Or is it those that gather in this building or in buildings around the world that belong to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? That's the qualifier, is it not, for His church. He is the head of the church. He is... <laughs> He is the supreme master. Can I go that far? He is the supreme, he is the one in charge. In Ephesians, if you will, and I'll just share a little piece with you. Ephesians chapter 5, I want you to listen to this. We go to this a lot of times in, in talking about uh, marriage and husband and wives, but I want you to listen. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church he himself being the savior of that body he is the savior he is the head of the church he is essential to the body the body can did not exist apart from Christ Jesus you realize if Jesus did not exist we wouldn't be here today we wouldn't have a reason together would we we would have a reason. He's essential. He, the church is the body of Christ. He is the head and we are the body. What does that tell us when we think about him being the head and us being the body? If <laughs> I'm looking around and see the age of folks in here. If, if my head's missing, what good is the rest of me? It, it's, it can't think, it can't move, it can't do anything, can it? So <laughs> the head is essential to the body in the, in the sense that uh, he gives life to the body, does he not? Our very life comes from Jesus Christ, the life of the body. Now, how many times in the body do we begin to think we're running things? It happens, does it not? Sometimes we begin to think we forget to talk to the head of the church who's in charge, right? Now he gives uh, churches a, a under-shepherd. He's given you all a wonderful under-shepherd to, to lead you. But Christ is the head of the church. And I'm not talking about Riverside. I'm talking about the church as a whole. The church as a whole. He is the head of it. He, not only is he the head of it, he is the one that gives direction. What tells your body to get up and go in the bathroom, brush your teeth, put your clothes on, come to church. Does that? Does your hands just automatically begin to do those things? No, you have to. You, this morning, you woke up and you said, "I'm going to church." Where did that thought and originate? 
right up here in the noggin, right? He started in, in the head. It, he is the one that gives directions. He's the one to give us direction. And when a church is listening to the head, when a, when a local church body is listening to the head and following His will, then God will be glorified and His will and His plan will be accomplished. Whether there's five of you or 5,000 of you, they have to be following Christ for direction. Who is it that gives guidance and goals and plans to the church? Do we just sit down and have committees? Do committees come up with what the church is supposed to do tomorrow? Baptists are the best at committees. We have committees on committees on committees, right? And, and the committee on committee meets to make another committee so the committee can do this. I, I won't even go, y'all know. But who is the one that should be giving us the plans and directions? You know, sometimes we try to get ahead of God in the things we do. For example, I remember the story uh, Henry Blackaby tells about them wanting to begin a college ministry. They felt led to do a college ministry. So they, they got a group together. They had a committee. They gathered up and they decided they would, they would go to uh, certain places on the campus and try to start holding Bible studies and because they felt like that's what God was doing, right? He wanted them to do. And they tried for two years and nobody would show. And finally, one day one of the members was on campus and a young lady that went to school there stopped him and said, Hey, what are you doing here? What are y'all, you know, you're obviously not a student. Said, well, we've been trying to hold a Bible study to teach people about Christ. She said, really? We have a group that's meeting in our dorm, and we've been meeting for a long time, and we just need somebody to come teach us. They says, well, okay, we'll do that. So they, they move all of their efforts into the door that God opened up, and they began to, to show up there, and suddenly they had hundreds of kids showing up for Bible study. Simply because not only did they hear God's desire, but they missed His timing and His plan. See, God was already at work ahead of them. They just needed to pay attention to what God wanted. He is the head that gives direction. He is the head that gives the plan. And is no, even a sin. Without your head, can your body do anything? You know, you can take a chicken and take his head off, and he's gonna flop around, run around for a few minutes. But eventually he'll kill over somewhere because the brain's missing, right? Even though it might be tiny, it still operates, right? Same with us. We are not useful apart from the head. Prime example, back to Blackaby's story. They're trying to do everything in their own, the body trying to do it on their own and not listening to the head's timing and location and looking for where God was at work. And they missed it. They wasn't being useful. They wasn't accomplishing what they felt like God called them to do until they listened to the head and they found where God was already at work. God is Jesus is the head of the church. We already talked about the fact we don't exist apart from Him, right? We don't exist. The church does not exist. If the head was to die, then the body would cease to have life, would it not? Physically, let me ask you, if the, the head was to be, was to die, the brain dies, even medically. You take someone that is brain dead, their body can't do anything. It just lays there. It lays there. It, it, it is, a, well, I guess you would say the problem is it ceases to listen to the commands and it's paralysis. You, you sever that connection, you sever that, that highway of, of communication between the brain and the rest of the body, and there's, it's total paralysis. It's just laying there, right? I wonder how often we find ourselves in paralysis because we're not listening to what the head says. I don't know about you, God has allowed me to, to preach and, and be in a lot of churches and a lot of places uh, not only here, but around the world. And I hate to say this, but I've been in some that I think was paralyzed because they stopped listening to what God said. You realize there are churches closing the doors every week in America. Why? Is that what God desires? That His body quit meeting together? Absolutely not. 
but the body must listen to the head. Jesus, he is also the head of the body, the church. He is church. He is the head of not just the church, but he says the head of the body of the church. And the body of the church is made up of who? You and I, right? So who is our supreme commander? Who is the one that tells us the direction to go? Who is the one that leads you to be here versus somewhere else? God does. He's the head. He is the direction of those things. Not only that, notice what he says here. He says, He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have preeminence in everything. Our Lord Jesus is our only hope. He is the only hope for mankind. Now, we, I, I cannot urge you enough to when it comes time to go to the polls, go to the polls and make your voice heard. Go vote. We have that right in America. Go use it. Whether you believe it works or not, exercise that right and vote. But you know what? Our hope is not in that White House seat. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. Because once America can be long gone, but if I have Jesus... I have what I need. I have what I need. He is our hope. He is the hope of mankind because He is the only hope for salvation, is He not? Jesus is the only way one can come to know Christ, come to know the Lord as their Savior, right? I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except by what? Me. Not by your works, not by your efforts, not by your church attendance, not by your name on a membership roll, not by anything else except by Jesus Christ himself. Because he said here, he did all of this on the cross. What? He said he made peace through the blood of the cross through him. Jesus made that peace for you and I. He is our hope of salvation. Not only is our, he is our hope for salvation, he is also our hope for sanctification. What does that big word mean? You want to, if we know Jesus as our Savior, we're called to be Christ-like. Hence the word Christian, right? Christian, Christ-like. We're called to be that. He starts a work in us that He will complete. We are His workmanship. He begins the work. He will finish the work. He is in that process. When you wake up tomorrow, when you're in Bible study this week, when you come Wednesday night and Brother Jim is teaching and God speaks to you about something in your life that needs to change, that is Jesus working on sanctifying you to become more like Him and less like you. He wants us to be the image of Him. Jesus is the image of <coughs> excuse me, of the invisible God. Verse 15, we just read that, right? We are, be, we are to be the image of Christ Jesus, right? The world ought to be able to see us and see Christ in us. He is our only hope for sanctification because you know why? We can't make those changes. It's His Spirit within us that gives us the power. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me, right? It's through Him. It's through Him. He's the one. He is our hope, if you will. Not only is He our hope for salvation and sanctification, He is our hope for satisfaction. Have you ever been restless? Ever been restless? I, I, I use this illustration sometimes, and I don't, it may not work for you all, but it does me. Someone that's lost and they're searching, they're restless, they just can't find that peace. Because they try to plug that hole in their heart with everything except for what fits there. The only thing that fits there is Christ Jesus. Because He is the one that brings peace. He is peace. He is joy. He is our salvation. He is all of those things. He is our satisfaction. He is the only one that can bring peace that passes understanding. You ever experience that? Circumstances around you are just crazy but yet you're at peace somehow. The only way you can do that is through Christ Jesus. See, my friends, that's what the world looks for. You know, the lost world today, you know what they're truly looking for? They're looking for authentic Christians. They want the real deal. What's the first thing, and I've said this, I've said it here many times, what's the first thing you hear when people talk about people that go to church? See there? Y'all know. Hypocrites, why? Because they believe you're saying one thing and living another. So what are they looking for? 
They're looking for the real deal. Someone that doesn't just talk about it, but lives it. That's what they're looking for. Someone that lives that out before them so that they, they can be drawn to that. Because why? They're no longer seeing you. They're seeing him in us. We're seeing that process of sanctification having taken place in our hearts. We have that satisfaction. We have that peace because we know the one who gives it. No one will ever see heaven apart from Jesus. No one will ever be holy apart from him. Be holy for what? I am holy. We're called to be holy because he is holy. No one will ever be truly happy apart from Jesus. That, it just can't happen. And you know what? He goes beyond happiness. He, he goes beyond just a temporary happiness. He goes to a joy that's unspeakable. It's one that's able to give you uh, an attitude of gratitude when the situations say you are to be bitter and mad. You ever been in those places? Yeah, sure we have. Those who know him find that he gives all of these things because Jesus is our hope. Why is he our hope? A couple of things. Notice what he says here. He is the beginning. He's the beginning. He's the one who started it all. In him, all things created for him, by him. They, he started all of those things. In the beginning, let there be. You know who was there present making that happen? Jesus. How do we know? The Bible says. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, Jesus all things were created. So when he said, let there be light, who was it that made light happen? Jesus did, right? John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Through him, everything started. When you look in the mirror, you're only seeing you because God made you. Jesus decided we need a pity living right here in Riverside. Amen. We need her. We need, and he created her the way he wanted her. I, I hadn't seen you in so long, Pete. This week, I just can't help it. I got to pick on you. Uh, he, he, he started that. He's the beginning of that. He made the world. Not only did he make it, but he sustains it. Not only did he decide, you know what? Riverside needs Petey. Riverside Baptist needs Petey, but I'm going to sustain her and give her health and strength and wisdom to do what I want her to do while she's there. Same thing for every one of you that are here. God chose you. He started it, and he's going to finish it with you. He's the beginning. He made the world. He sustains the world. Not only is he the, the, the beginning of all things, but he is... The beginning of the church, right? He's the beginning of the church. Jesus didn't just assume responsibility for something that already was. Jesus died to institute the church. He died for it. He paid the price for it. It's His. He bought it. He paid for it. We are His. He <clears throat> didn't assume it. He died to purchase it. And not only that, that means he died for us. He looked down and he saw Kyle and he says, as sorry as he is, I'm still going to die for him. And I, I'm going to do something with him. Might be a struggle, but I'm going to make an effort. He made a choice to die for us. Not only that, he not only did he purchased the church, <clears throat> It says he is the firstborn. Did you catch that? He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. He didn't say the only one born from the dead. He says the firstborn. And if we was to look in the Greek, the word that that firstborn comes from, uh, I ain't going to try to pronounce it. Uh, it's the same word we get prototype from. Jesus was the prototype. See, Jesus was hung on the cross. He died for our sins. They put him in the grave. He rose again. He's the firstborn from the dead. And that means that we're to follow. We are to follow that. We will be, <clears throat> even though we may physically die, we will rise again, right? First Thessalonians 5. 
And the dead in Christ shall rise, what? And be caught up, and we'll be caught up with them in heaven. See, he's not done with us when this world is. That's only the beginning. This is just a little short trial period to get us right. And so we have an opportunity to choose him. But see, he's the firstborn. He's the, he's the model that, that, that we're to follow. Even those, you think about Lazarus, you think about Dorcas, uh, the widow of, of Nain's son, if you will, Jairus' daughter. All of those Jesus brought back from the dead. You know what had to happen to them? They died again. I still, I think if I was Lazarus, I'd have argued. Lord, I don't want to come back. <laughs> I'll have to, I'm going to have to ask about that when I get there. <clears throat> they all died again, but see, when Jesus comes back, man, when he toots that horn, and it might be before we leave this morning, when he toots that horn, we get to be born forever. Firstborn from the dead to never die again. He is the first fruits from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead as a prototype for you and I because see the grave can't hold those that belong to Jesus Christ. You know as a Christian we should not fear death. Now I know many people fear that process. Understandably. I'm not sure what it's going to be. A friend of mine tells me all the time, he says, you know, everybody in the world wonders how they're going to die. He said, but I'm pretty sure I know how you'll die. He says, you'll be on a stick over an open fire in Africa somewhere. I said, that's in the cartoons, man. <laughs> we fear sometimes the process of that passing from here to there. But as a Christian, we should not fear that. Because we're stepping from this old ragged world into glory. Because why? Jesus is the firstborn from the dead so that we may follow him in that process, if you will. <clears throat> I'm going to be done on time this morning. Last thing I want us to look at in verse 18. It says, <clears throat> he's the head of the body, the church, he's the beginning, he's the firstborn from the dead so that he himself will come to have preeminence or first place in everything. That word preeminence just means to be first, to hold first place. Do we like to be in first place? But see, Jesus is to be first in everything. To be first in everything. It goes on to say in verse 19, I'll add this in there. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all of the fullness to dwell in Him. What does He mean, all of the fullness? All of His attributes, all of His power, all of His authority, everything about our God dwells in our God Jesus here. He is preeminent. He's first. He must come first. He should be first in your life. He should be first in your job should be first in your recreation, your world, your church, your home, your heart, etc. Every part of your life, Jesus ought to be preeminent. He should be first place. What does that mean? That means whatever, whatever's going on in your life, is God's choice in that situation your first choice? What? I like this job, God. I don't want to leave this job. I have another job for you, son. Are we willing to listen to what he says? What he has for us? Sometimes he calls us to do things we don't want to do. But if he's going to have preeminence in our life and in our decisions, we must be obedient to him. He is preeminent, if you will. <clears throat> God uh, placed Jesus on that throne in the universe, right? Philippians chapter 2, got to read it. For this reason, uh, uh, verse Philippians 2, 5 through 8 talks about the humility of Christ and he even going to the cross, humbled himself to the point of death on the cross. In verse 9 he says, for this reason God highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name which is above every name. We, we see that today, right? Remember we talked at the beginning, you can say the name of Jesus somewhere and people go, what? You can talk about God all day long in line at Walmart, but you talk about Jesus and watch and see how many heads turn. 
You know what? When I listen to a preacher I've never heard before, if they can go the whole sermon and not mention the name of Jesus, I might as well go and turn it off and find me another one. Because he's it. He's it. Man. Okay, let me get back to it. Uh, for this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know what, sometimes I, I just in my own little pea mind I think, why did he even allow us to speak that name? You ever thought about the name of Jesus? The power and authority behind that name and he still allows us to call upon that name? You know, the, the Jews, the Jewish nation, they, they show great uh, humility and fear before the Lord when it calls to calling on his name. You know, they, they wouldn't even utter his name out loud. They would call Yahweh. I mean, just what you think about that, that word Yahweh. It really means to breathe in and breathe out. Yahweh. Every time you breathe, you're calling his name. Yahweh. Jesus. There will come a day when every knee, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Does that mean all of these woke people will bow one day? Does that mean one day Hitler will say, yeah, he was it? He's probably already made that comment at this point. Every knee will bow before him. And every tongue will confess. Because why? Jesus is preeminent above all things. God placed him on that throne. But he must be on the throne in our own heart. You know, you, you hear the term making Jesus Lord. You need to make him Lord of your life. My friend, he's already Lord. You just need to let him have that place in your life. You need to get off of your throne and let him have it. Let him take that place because it's rightfully his. If you belong to him and he's your Lord and your Savior, that is rightfully his place in your life. You have said, when you accepted him and you said, I don't want to be in charge anymore, I want you to be in charge. But sometimes we're like, scoot over. I want to make some choices today. What happens when we do that? Trouble, right? I'll leave it at that. Does Jesus have preeminence in your life? Does he have that first place? That's, this morning's just been a glimpse of Jesus and who he is. You remember the disciples, Jesus asked them, who do men say that I am? Disciples, they spouted out all kind of names. Some say Elijah, some say uh, Jeremiah, some, yeah, some one of the prophets. And he says, but who do you say that I am? And that's the important question that Jesus come around to. Who do you say Jesus is? Of course, Peter makes that statement not on his own. The Holy Spirit gives that to him. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter got it right that day. Jesus even bragged on him a little bit. But did Peter get everything right? Oh, my soul. I love Peter because he probably shows the most humanity of all of them. Open mouth, insert foot about half the time. I like Peter because I can relate to him. <clears throat> but if Jesus was to ask you that question today, just, just picture that. Just picture if you're sitting around a campfire and Jesus says, who do you say I am? How would you respond? How would you respond to Jesus? How would you define who he is in your life? Could you say that you are the head? Could you say that you are my hope? You're my heart? You're my life? Could you say all those things about Jesus? Or is he just somebody you talk about without ownership of? 
Because, see, he paid the ultimate price to sit on that throne in your life. And through that, he gives us that ability to be the second born from the dead, if you will, and to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus must have preeminence in your life. And if he don't, today's the day. You know, as a Christian, and I'll just share this and then I'll pray. There have been times in my life where Jesus didn't have preeminence. I literally said, get, get off, I'm running things. You just sit over there for a while. Does that mean I'm lost? No, it just means I was not following and let, allowing him to do what he wanted to do in my life. But when we let God do what he wants to do in our life, we have that peace, we have that joy, we have that, all those things that we talked about, it's present because why? The king of kings is in charge. He's in charge. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning for the opportunity just to uh, consider who you are, Jesus. There's, Lord, I don't think there's any way for us to fully know everything about you. Lord, I thank you for your word, your precious word you've given us, your letter to us to help us to know and to understand you. Lord, I pray that uh, this morning everyone within the sound of my voice, first of all, knows you as their personal Savior. Second of all, if they do, that you do have that preeminence. You have that first place in their life. Lord, forgive us in the areas we have not surrendered that control. Lord, point those out to us. Lord, show us in our own life where we're still trying to hold on to that control that we would let go and let you have your way in our lives. Lord, that we would bring glory to you, honor to you. Lord, that people would see you in us. That they couldn't look at you, look at me and say, Kyle, you're just a hypocrite Christian because my life depicts you. Lord, we love you and we praise you. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen.